So welcome everybody to the next episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast uh, in partnership with our good friends over at Operation Smile. As my colleague Rose mentioned, we're delighted to welcome two really well-established um, individuals from the finance profession onto the podcast today. Uh, great careers for both of these guys with the, some of the best companies in the world. So it's a great uh, privilege uh, to have uh, the time with uh, Yasko and Rafa on the podcast today. So I know we've got a, a good range of questions to go through that have come from our network internally and, and externally. So I'm going to kick off with the, the first one today, which is quite a, a broad one, uh, let's say. Um, it's really based around career development, because I know a lot of the listeners, this is what they listen into the podcast for, for help and advice and motivation on career development and choosing the right career. So I thought I'd ask you really what um, your, the start of your careers were like, and uh, if you're able to tell the audience a bit more about the your, your first roles in finance uh, as well, because I think that would be interesting as to you know, how the career shaped from there. So maybe Rafa, if you want to go first on this, and then we can uh, yeah listen to to your answer on that, and then Yasko can uh, chip in on this one uh, after you've uh, had uh, gone through the answer, Rafa. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Paul, for organizing this. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, very interesting question, because I will say that my career really started in an unusual way. Um, I started in, uh, a, first of all, trying a little bit of the financial market, right? the, being in the uh, a investment uh, side of the trading options, calls, etc. back in 2000, almost to the beginning of 2000. But I uh, always wanted to be more on the real economy, uh, really close to the to the ground of, of, of the products and, and really being able to touch what I'm, what I'm doing. So I, I started my first role in Procter & Gamble in internal audit. Um, and I was, I have to say that uh, as, a, as probably not a initially sexy role, I can tell you that it's one of foundational role and it has shaped the rest of my career a lot in terms of uh, Getting the the governance and the and the, the, the doing the right thing, well established from the very beginning in my career. So that was a role uh, um, auditing pretty much all the all the plans that Procter Gamble had uh, in in Europe. A lot of traveling, a lot of learning, and uh, very enjoyable, very enjoyable. Uh, and that was my first uh, my first role. And I think it's I would probably recommend it very highly. That uh, it's it's a role that creates a very strong foundation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's what we, we 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 saw a lot in, let's say, when I first started doing finance recruitment 20 years ago, the, the audit route was a route that a lot of people took to get the exposure to different divisions, different departments, you know, it, travel and meet all the key people and have a really broad experience. But you tend probably not to see it um so often these days but from what you've um what you've mentioned there and the career you've had since it sounds like it's still something you would uh, potentially recommend people to to do if they get the opportunity to do it absolutely absolutely i mean i, I think it's a role that uh, it really gets the financial uh, knowledge of the uh, foundation i mean for, uh, let's let's not forget the finance manager really is a uh, it's all about the guarantor on on a stewardship of governance it's a fundamental part of every senior leadership in, in the finance function. So being able to have been exposed to that on what's the importance of the controls, what's the importance of internal audit, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, aspect to, to do at a certain point in your career. And probably you could argue, is it the first role, is it the second? I think it's either or, but certainly it will be, it's something that I'm very happy to, to, have, been, to have been done it. Mm -hmm. What about yourself, Jasko? Is there any similarities between yourself and Rafa on that stage uh, or any, any differences you would pick out? Well, um, except for the good looks, so we have other, <laughs> other similarities. So, I mean, I mean, it's interesting. I actually didn't know, I know Rafa since this a while, but I didn't know that he started as well his career in investment banking. So that's why I started. And, um, and that was my first job. Um, and, and it was it was a holistic failure, right? So I mean, I was in a job I didn't like. I mean, uh, obviously there, you always learn, right? You always learn things, and you learn as you go, and you learn as you grow. And and, and for me, it was just something where where I couldn't simply um, feel somehow home in in the job in the role. It just didn't didn't really talk to me. So I, I took a similar path like like Rafa did, and uh, eventually um, started as well with with Procter and Gamble. 
And um, I was, um, I was, my first job was a forecaster job. So financial forecaster role, which I guess is one of these core skills next to, to compliance or, or internal audit, like back to, to Rafa's point, which, which you just need to build. And, and I do believe the earlier you build them in your career, the better, because they do build some of the foundation of, of everything, everything that comes afterwards, right? I mean, I think you will probably agree compliance, you have the, the forecasting element, you might have the, the anal analysis, kind of this muscle that you need to build and kind of business partnership. And obviously, which on this fundament, you build all the rest, right? And the rest meaning is, is equally important and becomes increasingly more important the more senior you are of how do you communicate, how do you take people on board, um, make sure that you get the right support that you need along the way. You know, influencing people positively becomes obviously more important as you go. But some of these core core skills, um, like forecasting, like like compliance, uh, you know, the earlier you can get them, the better. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you mentioned that the, the business partnering side of things there, and I think that's something a big change that we've seen in the finance discipline uh, over the last twenty years. I would say. I mean, I think. You know, a long time ago, the accounting role was was seen by a lot of companies as very much a numbers function, and uh, the business partnering side of it was not often the the key thing that was part of a a hiring process when when companies were looking to bring people into this area. Whereas now, it's almost regardless of what the role is and what the level of the role is, people have got to have either the the drive to learn to be a good business partner or they've got to have that strong you know, communication skills. And, and I guess for both of you, having that foundation at Procter & Gamble, which are a leader as far as that is concerned with commercial finance business people, I mean, that, that's got to be a, a great a great business to, to have grown up in. Uh, so a question, I guess, to both of you on that side is, you know, what did you what did you learn from your time at, at Procter & Gamble? Yeah, yeah. I guess I would probably good, like it's a very good question, and I would just like to go a step back, right, before probably going into into what I learned in Procter and Gamble. I think for me, it's like, you know, what is what is the one lesson learned when when choosing to go for for a, for a finest as a career path, or deciding to go for for a company. And I think the one lesson that I took away was, you know. Don't go necessarily. So the things that you necessarily or badly want might not be the best things for you, right? And it goes to the, back to career choice that, that I made, right? And I decided to go into for investment banking. I mean, prior to that, I was um, well established in one of the other small FMCG companies like Biasdorf. And, and, you know, it was 2005, 2006, everyone wanted to do investment banking. It was before the, the bubble burst in 2008, right? <laughs> so it, it was the job you want to go for. If you're cool, you become investment banker or you become consultant, what have you. And, and, I, and I, had, I, had, I was lucky to have the choice, right? And, and I went for the investment banking and, you know, it, it didn't take long to realize that it's just not something that I personally as an individual like. And we're just coming from is I think, do think that if you think about the, as a career, as, as a marathon, and I know many people say that in a sprint, just make sure that along the marathon, along these many years that one way or another we end up working, that you feel comfortable in your own skin and what you're doing. And if that means that you're going for a career choice, which might not be just sexy at that point of time, look, I can tell you now, many folks perhaps that have been working back with me or with Rafa, they would be you know very glad if they would have made potentially different career choices, right? So the thing what sucks is it's changing along the way and it's changing with time. And I would always advise to be honest and sincere to yourself. And and you know if 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 for one way or another you recognize that you made the wrong decision, sometimes it's just better to you know pull the trigger and move on and and, and admit that was not probably the best choice you made in your life. And you know then new new opportunities arise. And I think that's on the career. I think the other lesson learned for me as somebody now really functionally or finance financially speaking from my from my from my job I, I i do think that it's important to choose companies or 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 to choose teams or to choose business units where which help you to bring you at your best and and what i mean by that if you're somebody who is more entrepreneurial somebody who is more creative you might be 
better at home at some of the companies or some units within the company. I mean, Rafael Meister were the choice because PNG owned from Pringles to Fabric to everything, right? I mean, now they're, they're downsized normally, but you know, but all of these little units, actually individual companies, brands, companies, they have a different philosophy. They have a different different equity, right? And I was lucky to land in the Pringles business. For me, it was, it was a blessing because me being more creative, more independent, needy, I, I needed that and I still need this space for flexibility and my own decision making to a certain extent and, and landing in that team, it gave me all that. If I would have perhaps in Procter & Gamble and Fabricare, which is very, very streamlined, huge organization, right, which is more running force, I would not have been necessarily perhaps as lucky as I was in Pringles, which was a great start for me to kick off my career in Pringles, uh, in PNG. So what I'm saying is like, just be mindful what you're choosing for, knowing yourself and your own preferences um, it, it is often decisive and critical as you think about your, your development as an individual and also as a professional. Yeah, I mean, if I will, if I will add a, a couple of more points, I mean, I'm 100% agree with what Jesco uh, has mentioned. I mean, and, and we coincide in PNG many years, and and it's true. I mean, it's, it's everything that, that that he said is said very, very true in terms of the different companies and the different philosophies and the, how the different teams are. I think a, for me, uh, Tom, the 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 biggest lesson, especially when you're looking at finance to be a, a, at the next level, to be those successful finance leadership, is that a Yes, finance is all about the numbers, but the reality is it's not always all about the numbers. The analysis is going to be is going to be done. It has to be rigorous. You need to be comfortable with it, with how the analysis is. But the reality, and that's something that probably one of my biggest lessons that I learned in my career, is the importance of communication. The importance of how do you convey the message? And finance can be very complex, and being able to convey that simplicity and those outcome, the what I call the so what of an analysis is absolutely critical and it makes you a key partner um, uh, in your team and key influential. I have seen, unfortunately, many cases in which analysis have been done there and has been good, but it goes completely undersell by the communication or becoming very sloppy at the end of the equation and very sad to see people, analysts, or even managers doing a fantastic job and not coming across just because they didn't sell. So don't forget that, yes, finance is important, it's the content, but how do you deliver that content? It's critical because we manage in finance things that are very complex, not that many people follow, and you need to be able to bring that complexity to very, very simple terms to become truly influential and identify what really matters. And it's very easy, for, very easy to get Miriam, Miriam down in the in the details. Mm-hmm. Well, it's really interesting uh, the comments you both made, and I think I'd I'd like to just pick on something that uh, Jasco mentioned actually in terms of the um, knowing what you like and what you enjoy in the job, um, because I think it's also aligned with you mentioned the word lucky quite a few times in that uh, in that in that answer. And I, I almost feel when we interview people on the podcast, they they almost have the same type of approach, you know, where they, they sort of find the job they enjoy and then they become lucky. But it's almost if, you, if you're if you doing something you, you enjoy, you put obviously more efforts and enthusiasm into it. And then the luck almost comes from your general sort of approach and your mindset. So, I mean, is that something you'd sort of agree with from what you've seen yourselves over, over the years? I think we 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 are both, or I think we are all in general relatively lucky, right? And I have been lucky to make perhaps the one right decision at an early stage as a young person, a young individual. Uh, and, and perhaps if you would have taken that decision differently. And and to be clear, in my case, I didn't make this decision probably always right. And and that I was lucky was probably rather a matter of luck than than brains in my case that I decided to go the path. It was perhaps a gut feeling, but not what. But I'm saying, I mean, by luck is. I do think that um, I do think that everything bottoms out at two things. I would say one life philosophy. You know, how do you think and take the life and take the challenges come its way, and how do you take people on board? Back to Rafa's point, like what does it mean to be influential to you? And and there are different approaches right that one can choose. And 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 beyond the life philosophy, I think again, just you know, knowing perhaps with, with your own strengths and and, and weaknesses and, and what you as an individual want, and that's not something that anyone can tell you. I mean, obviously, there's a great environment of family and friends who know you, so you know, talking to those is always beneficial and helpful. I, when again, when choosing my first job, didn't listen to them, so I thought I was smarter than them, and I knew myself better. 
<laughs> less than one. <laughs> that's just uh, true about it. And yeah, but that's that's probably um, uh, uh, yeah, that's probably what I would say about no, it. No, 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 it's true. I mean, it, it's it's just interesting, you know, to hear the um, the thoughts on it. I mean, uh, I don't know, Rafa, you've had a bit of time to think about this now, so I don't know. Would you would you go along that line with Yasko as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. And actually, I will go even one point farther. I mean, the wall out there is different versus when we started uh, almost 20, 22 years ago, right? I mean, we enter in a company, uh, Jasko and I, to that. Uh, we were very lucky to enter in, a, in such a company like Procter & Gamble that really take care of you in many, many fronts. And we were entering a way in which it was educated to us to say, hey, this is a long term. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. So there was all the time a lot of view so you do this then you do that then you do this thing so you take your choices but it was all very well established and that was great now if i think I re and reflect now in the reality of the world today um, it's, it's, it's very different so my advice to to people uh, in that they are in the early stage of the career or in the middle way of the career is that the one plan that you cannot lie to yourself is, is your own plan, right? It's the, your own, uh, what did you want to achieve? You're expecting to get certain skills by so many years, or you expect to get promoted by so many years, etc. If you don't, If you don't get it, at the end of the day, it's going to be your choice. You need to decide how much is enough so you can move your career. Don't stay stuck in a place that you're not feel comfortable waiting for that promotion, that skill to happen if you're not seeing it happening. And, and, and move on and keep evolving yourself by by finding the jobs that you like. So uh, I think this is the one piece that is a big lesson that I think it's changed. It's very different versus when, when Jasko and I, definitely when I started back in, in 2000. And, um, and that's uh, something in, something something to have is that, that have that plan of yourself. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, don't, don't don't lie to yourself in the way that that's your plan, right? I mean, you can find your excuse, but you're lying to yourself. It's not like you're trying to make your manager happy or by doing something. It's just looking into yourself. Mm -hmm. and I guess a question that's quite well aligned to this. So you talk about planning and the career progression and so on. But I uh, I always like to ask guests on the podcast, especially ones that are at the level uh, of, of both of you, around you know, why you why you chose to to work in finance in the first place, you know, because we often find that, you know, some people almost fall into a, a career, a discipline as a career. Others are, are motivated by their parents or somebody around them has, has influenced them to go into a certain discipline. So uh, maybe maybe Rafa first, you know, what, what was the reason you, you chose to go into finance in the first place? Wow. I mean, uh, I'm probably going to sound a little bit of a cliche, but uh, it started really as a tradition. I mean, I come from a family of uh, all my family, all my kids, my, my brothers and my brother and, and the two sisters, they all went through the finals career. Um, you're talking about 2000. In 2000, if you wanted to be successful, you'd have to go into the investment banker. You had to go through the uh, uh, consulting wall. And that was kind of like the fashion part. And um, and there was a little bit of an influence on that front. And I always been very close to the numbers. So I enjoyed it, that, uh, that aspect too. But to be fair, I think it also grew on me. So when I took the role in P&G and I started to go into internal audit and then starting to work with uh, uh, assisting multifunctional teams, I early in my career find the way of the finance role within a multifunctional team. And that's what I, that's, that's what it grew with me, the passionate finance and where finance needs to be. And this is the moment where I started to see finance is not a data crunching number. It's are not the guys who put it in the, in the minus two and don't talk to them. They're weird people. No, absolutely not. Finance has so much more to do and so much more to add and so much to bring to the table. And this is where I grow. And, and I can see in today, even 20 years after I started that finance is still have a long to go, a long way to go. We're certainly not where where where, where we should be. Some companies are more advanced than others, but uh, a, a other side still have a lot to to develop and, and work. And, and, and that's where my passion continues to be. And I think we 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 have that to be no means of that. My vision is always to be able to partner with my CEO in a way that he and I we can be almost interchangeable. And it's, it's a difficult one. It's a, it's a journey. It's a long term. A, this one for sure is a marathon. That's not a sprint. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about yourself, sure. Jasko? Was it similar for you? Did, were you, did you have the, the influence of your family to go in the route of finance or was it something different for yourself? Well, 
for, for me, it was more, I think, well, I mean, except that I like counting money, right? So it is a kind of... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it, I think it was a bit of a discovery, right? Like, um, I, I, I don't know, like, I always knew I, I want to go in that direction. And I can't tell you why, relatively early in my in my career in education, actually, before I started working, I, I went specifically into more that direction. I realized I'm good with numbers. Um, then I also realized quickly that I don't want to be an auditor. I did an internship in Germany, I do lots of internships. I did an internship in audit, I did it in the FMCG, in private equity, what have you, right? Um, and I just could say that was very helpful for me to guide me what is it I like, what I'm good at, what is it I'm like that I'm not good at, and then what is it I'm not good at and I don't like, right? And, and, and kind of figuring that out was very helpful. Um, and and no, like for me, I would say like what I perhaps well, what I value a lot is the ability to connect numbers which are rational, they're patterns, they are, you know, kind of algorithms, if you like, which are telling, which give you a certain level of, a certain level of feeling that you kind of can predict the future by understanding the past, which is not always true, but that's kind of bottom line of it. And putting that into a business context, back to Rafa's point, which is how can you help to co-pilot the business and really be be a sparing partner to your, to, your, to your business partners and build the right level of confidence and trust and influence the decision making. I think that is a talent that is an art and I think it's a very highly valued and, and appreciated um, piece of work, right, that not not everyone can do. Um, and I think that's why I like finance at the end of the day, right? It's, it's, it's about that. And I think it's also the fact that you can do like, you can really, really touch people, right? You can really, um, make a difference for that. You can, you can help to shape a great business results and you can develop people along the way from business partners to, to others. And obviously you learn every day, every second. And, you, and there's so many things that you did that are out there. Uh, it just gives you, for me, finance gives me the room to put my nose into everything, to learn about everything, to realize if I like it or not, to understand it, to challenge it, uh, and, and to make a difference. That's, that's probably the bottom line of it. Mm-hmm. No, and I think the, the the word the learning word has come around quite a number of times in this conversation, and I think it's a uh, yeah. The, there's always so many changes happening internally and externally in, in for the finance discipline, and uh, I mean I think Rafa, you mentioned earlier that there's still more round the corner, and I think a, a big challenge that I think uh, finance faces, but uh, businesses in general face is the the impact of BI and data uh, on on the role and the discipline you know, in, in the future. And I guess, you know, it would be quite good maybe to start the, this um, with, with Jasko, to be honest, given that he's at uh, Microsoft at the moment and uh, is uh, leading the way in BI and data. So I was just interested to know how you might find, you know, BI and data is going to impact the finance function moving forward and, and the challenges that it represents to, to the finance director. Absolutely, 100% with what you just said, Paul, in terms of uh, the importance. Um, it, it's coming, and and the power that uh, that the, the data has is, is incredible, right? And it's going to shape the, the finance roles, and, and it's going to help. But the reality, and this is something that you, I would like to break the paradigm that people said, oh, the data is going to, or the automation is going to kill finance roles, or it's going to eliminate them. I don't believe so. I honestly, I truly don't believe so. Uh, it's going to bring more automation. It's going to bring what it's going to give, in my opinion, is going to free up an enormous amount of capacity to be able to look at the numbers and really do the the so what that we were talking before, right? So it's, a, it's to bring that analysis, to bring that, that uh, influential skills and communication. The data per se will be probably done but the, the finance analysis and the finance directors will have to be people who um, look at, they can interpret the data and you can convey the message in a very simple way. And I think this is what we're seeing. And, and actually in my current company, we, we have an enormous amount of data and, and this is where we are trying, we, we're always trying to strive and how do we improve our systems so we make things easier and more automated, not to eliminate headcounts, but to be able to free up capacity so we can really strive the business and to and to drive the, uh, and help making the strategic decisions by leveraging that data. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jasko, obviously working, working for Microsoft, you, you have a lot of exposure to this area. I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, BI and data uh, posture at the moment? 
Look, I, 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 I fundamentally believe that in, in a few years down the road, when we look back, when we're even older, Rafa, when we look back at that, I think we'll realize that we've been part of an industrial revolution. I really believe that. Uh, we're just middle in it and we're just not realizing and seeing it eventually. Kind of, you, you cannot see the forest because of the trees. But I do think that, especially in the, in the years to come, and in part also driven by, by you know, like by, by COVID, if you think about it, like how the way we are working has changed. I think that many years of, of, of innovation eventually has been just a handful of years. And I think that is going to change fundamentally the way, not just finance, but finance as well, um, as function will evolve. And for me, it's important to say here evolve because it's not about eliminating a function. You can't, finance will always be needed, same same as sales, same as marketing and organization, but it's changing fundamentally what you require as a skill set to be successful um, as, as a finance person. Now, if you just reflect a little bit of what I talked before, like this hard skills that we had to, to, to gain, and I'm still proud of them, compliance, forecasting, analysis, what have you, right? But take the forecast, right? The forecast is becoming very much automated process. So all the new folks, all the, all the sort of new kids on the block, which are joining now, like their skills probably might be rather skewed to our more that is what I would call soft skills, like how do you take business partners on hand? What's the right collaboration? What's the right communication much earlier in, 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 in the career than probably what it was for, for, for Rafa and me. It doesn't mean that they don't need an understanding of what the forecast is and how it works, but the level and the depth of understanding and the amount of time they will spend to create a forecast will be and is already today fundamentally different than what, what, what we had to do. I mean, I myself have been back together with Rafa building crazy Excel models and we still do in part, but the dimension of the craziness is just is just very different today than it was back then, right? And and, and I think it's just eventually netting out in one thing is kind of productivity and the productivity in the sense that I have more time, back to Rafa's point, to focus my energy and attention on more meaningful and more value-adding activities than, than, let's say, playing around with X and trying to figure out what are the specific trends or what have you. It's there. I open a, 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 a Power BI or I open a dashboard and whatever product you're using there, it tells me my revenue, my sales, it tells me my, my, my P&L, I can get daily trends. How does it compare to the last five years? Is there, if I'm in the retail, like, um, in the retail business, okay, what's my daily sales on that day? What are the patterns behind? What's the mix behind? There's lots of automated analysis being done behind where I don't need people to do it, but the people that would usually do it are focusing the energy on interpreting this data and helping the business to take the right decisions. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think in terms of, let's say, people looking to go into the finance discipline, it makes it harder for them now because I guess in the past it used to be a case you know, if you wanted to move into finance and accounting you might study a, a CPA or something along that line and then that would be your opening to get into finance whereas almost I can see in the future that actually the CPA whilst it'd be nice to have it's not going to be essential it's more going to be you know are you strong as a person can you challenge and influence people in finance outside of finance and, it, and it's now, that's a lot harder to learn, I think, than it is to go and study for you know, a, a qualification, you know. So can you see, is it going to be harder, do you think, for people to get into this area in the future? I mean, I, I can really try, Rafa, if you like, on this one. So I don't have a CPA, right? Um, I, I, I tried SEMA, but I wasn't smart enough. So I failed, I felt twice, <laughs> give up. I was like, you know, forget it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm really trying my very hard, my very best. My wife, she was laughing at me. I was like, okay, I just let this one be. Um, <laughs> it's just not, just not smart enough for it. That's, I think, the bottom line, which is horrible to say as a finance person. But it might ask in part your question, okay? I, I don't think there's one formula to be successful. And, and I'm not saying that I'm necessarily successful, but I think in general, there's not one, one formula to be as a successful finance professionals. Um, I know many individuals who have many, many, many diplomas and many certifications that can be useful. But back to my original point, if you're in the wrong job or a company which does not value that, it brings you nothing. It's basically, you know, coming to a party, being decently dressed up, while the motto of the party is a fashion and the carnival, right? So while you're right in what you are wearing, it's just you're the wrong party. So the benefit that you're getting and attention is a different one. Um, 
So, so when I'm just coming from, I think it's really individual choice. I do recall, and, and the thing depends as well on the country where you are on geographies, that in some geographies worldwide, like a CPA might be really the entry ticket. Um, personally, when I'm going for candidates, I'm not, when I'm interviewing people, it's for the sort of the jobs I would argue, be it PNG, be it, be it Amazon, be it, be it now Microsoft, I, I, I don't, for me, it's not not the decisive criteria, right? Now, if you have a CPA and you did sales in between and you want to go to finance, it can really make difference. But if you have a CPA and you enter the company, start to work, if you don't have a CPA, but your CV is telling your skills, your assignments that you made are meaningful and telling, and you can show that you have landed impact and how did you land the impact, I think that's eventually what makes a difference. Yeah, I, I will. I will add to to Jasko. I mean, I will agree with him. I mean, I when I'm interviewing people, and, and we are interviewing at the moment a lot, uh, CPA or those kind of qualification is not necessarily a requirement. Uh, we don't look specifically for 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 a only the CPA people, or only the masters, or only the MBA. I think things are changing, and uh, for me, it's more about experience that they bring. It's more about the software skills. And I think to, to, to Jasko's point, I mean, the, the wall is very bright for finance. It's very, very bright because of everything that Jasko was saying before, right? The, all the uh, efficiencies that we're going to get through the analysis, the data, the Power BI, it's going to require that people are far more uh, empathetic uh, and, and have more uh, soft skills. And those, you don't get necessarily those through the CPAs. Uh, you get those more from the, from the experience. Now, having said that, it also requires, it also depends on what type of roles you're looking for, right? So if you're looking to, if you're the type of person who said, really, no, no, I really want to make sure that everything is, I'm very detailed. I want to make sure that everything is right. I want to make sure that it's, it's accounting is where I really care and making sure the financial statements and I really get into that type of roles, then of course the CPA will give you the background, will give you the knowledge that you require. Um, I'm thinking what I'm talking here now more from the business partner FP&A type of role uh, in which a, it's more about the interactions that you have with multifunctional partners. It's more about the interaction you have with your marketing, your sales. How do you influence? How do you steer the business? How do you, how do you are able to convey the message that we were saying before? The communication for me is critical. I've seen in many cases, and I repeat myself, uh, many times the communication from finances uh, doesn't play in our favor. And I think this is what people need to spend more time on making sure that uh, that communication, that message is clear and uh, those software skills. Um, and, and I'm more looking for that type of experience and that diversity than the specific title here and there. And I know that for the young people coming, the, the, the organ, people from the university getting out to the job market, they want to be different. What can I do? And, and I agree 100% with Jasko. It's, it's, there is a big geographical aspect that if you are to tap into the uh, Anglo-Saxon business in the UK uh, is very charter or title driven. Well, that's a uniqueness from the from the from that market. Uh, it might be different, in, in when you're looking into Germany, we might be looking different if you're looking into into Spain. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's something that people need to need to understand and need to need to adapt. I mean, I, I can tell you if 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 I if someone were to tell me hey, I'm, I'm really looking for a job in the UK and I'm starting, I I will probably tell him this and it might not be the best thing or it might not be the most fancy thing that you to do but mo most likely you're going to need a, a title of this type because the market rules by that i mean it's not a critique it's a reality well maybe in other places it's a little bit more different or they look at the top of all the top of activities no i mean it's it's good to, to get both of your thoughts on this and i think um you know i, I suppose We've talked a bit of the uh, about the similarities that you both have in your career. One, I guess, one of them is that um, you, know, you you both worked in a range of different locations and and probably push yourselves out of the, your comfort zone uh, to move location, move companies, uh, put yourself in in challenging positions. Uh, I mean, do you think that that has also been played quite a major part in you being? strong business partners as well because you you're obviously you've got the cultural awareness you 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 you've challenged yourself to work in these different locations over the years uh, absolutely i mean if i may jump in absolutely i this this goes without saying i mean the the, the enrichment that you get in the cultural by being able to be exposed to to multiple types of people multiple locations it's uh, it's critical it only can help you uh, so certainly, I will encourage any any new person coming to the to the world, or or, or finance, or even anyone who wants to change the the roles, that to really open their minds. They're like, 
going abroad and working in different locations and different places it can only help you. It can really only help you. And, and, and I mean, if I see Jasko, we met him in Geneva. I know he's in Singapore. He was before that. And I started in Madrid. I went to Brussels, Geneva, and now I'm in, uh, commuting back and forward in Berlin. It's just, uh, it's a different way. It's a, it's a different way. And, and all these experiences are enrichment because you really get exposed to, to different people and diversity. And, and that's, that's a critical point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know, obviously, Jasko, you're uh, over in Singapore at the moment, as we can see from your, your background as well. I mean, I guess you'd, you'd agree with what Rafa was saying there as well, I suppose. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was thinking as you guys were talking, like, I believe the world is right now probably not at its best place, right? Given that I don't want to go into politics, but, you know, there's some obviously, like, people are trying to kind of divide more than they get together. We went through 20 years of globalization, right? And obviously, there are a couple of things now, and one can have a different point of view and all that. I guess where I stand from is, you know, my wife being French, um, myself having an immigration background, being a German citizen. Look, I do feel as, as, as a world citizen. I sincerely do. Um, and I think there's so much enrichment in just getting to know different cultures. We don't need to agree on everything, and, and by the way, should we won't, uh, but just knowing and trying to understand what are the drivers behind some of the communication styles in your everyday work can be extremely beneficial because it just helps you to put things into context and not to take some of the things that you would normally offend you, perhaps, um, not to take them seriously or not to take things that some may sound as a compliment as a compliment because you know it's actually just in politeness, nothing nothing else. And I think the earlier you figure it out, the better it is. Um, so yes, absolutely. Every every new, it, it's painful. Like it gets more painful when you have a family and if you listen to Rafa, he's commuting. So it, it's not great that the same split families for a couple of months. So it is painful. It does impact the family and, and, and it's not always easy. But I do see the, the reward you're getting from that to be disproportionately higher than just staying within your own comfort zone. Mm-hmm. No, and I think it's really interesting, especially when we speak to finance people on the podcast, because obviously, typically in, in most per- people's roles in finance, there's the elements of risk and control in some shape or form. And uh, I always find it's quite interesting to ask people about their, their careers and, and the risk and controls they've had over their own careers. And you normally find that actually, you know, the people who, who, who have excelled in their career in finance and, and have really enjoyed their, their time in the discipline have taken you know, risks through their career. They've, they've been calculated as managed risks. They've been either around geography, either around a move to a, a different company, but each time th- there's been a risk involved and, and people have learned something from it. So going back to uh, something else you mentioned that this running through the podcast as well is to to learn from every experience you're having as well and to take that on to the next, um, you know, the next experience. So I think it's uh, yeah really interesting to get your your thoughts on these these things and um i guess another thing we, we've touched on uh, through the podcast is um you know people and and um you, i think you both mentioned about when you're uh, evaluating people's profiles and cvs and so on i don't think we can have a podcast on the emea recruitment uh, chat and not at least have one question about recruitment you know so i mean obviously the market at the moment is tough you know with the, the whole covid situation you know the you know, finding a new role and onboarding people is is very challenging. Uh, you know, and I thought I'd just ask you both, really, from the, your experience over the years, what has been what you feel is key to an efficient and effective recruitment process to, to getting the right the right people. Well, Rafael, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can chime in. A wow, that's a that's a that's a top question because. Um, I've been in both sides. I've been kind of like in the candidate role and also in the recruiting role. And uh, it's, it's a difficult. It's a, it's a little bit like a, at the end of the day, it's like a marriage. It's like a blind date, right? You're trying to kind of like meet together and, and the processes sometimes don't and give all the all the visibility and all the things that you, you want. And sometimes you have misexpectations. You can hire the right person and you're selling the job and you've done such a good job selling the job that then the person arrives to the role and it's like, uh, this is not, not even close to what you told me during the interview. So it's always a little bit of a challenge there. So I think that my piece of advice would be that, uh, it, first of all, be authentic and, and really show yourself as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as, as you are and, and, and really ask a lot of questions. Um, and I think the other aspect I will say as part of the recruitment process uh, to the candidates is that don't underestimate the, the, 
the, the, your networks, right? And then really to get as much information as you need in your network, whether it's internal network, whether it's an internal external network. And, uh, and, and as Jasko said, if, if you feel it's not the right party for you, then it's not the right party for you. There's nothing bad about it. It's much better to say that and to find it be true to yourself than you jumping in a role in which you may not like it because, believe me, after three, four months, five months, you're going to realize that you don't like it. And then it's a waste of time for you and it's a waste of time for the company that is looking looking for you. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough and... When we are from the point of the candidates, you kind of like feel a little bit like, yeah, the companies are the bad guys and, and, and they don't want to hire me. But believe me that when we are in the side of the company, we're trying to find the candidates. We also have our challenges. So it's, it's really both trying to find a way to, to, to blend together. And, uh, and, and, and we are lo looking at a lot of people and, and just as well. And sometimes it's, uh, when, when we don't hire, it's not because we don't like the people. It's that we don't find the right profiles, right? And we're trying to find... Uh, the, how do we how do we marry together? And the challenge of the recruiting is like you're taking decision on the basis of one hour conversation at at most, and and that's sometimes a challenge that takes a lot of gut feeling. Uh, so for them, for the candidates to really help in terms like is this the role that you like and ask so many questions is the key one and, and inform yourselves. Yeah, that's cool. No, uh, Yasko, would you go along with that as well? No, I, I go absolutely along with that. I think Rafa is spot on. There's not much, much I believe to add. Um, I, I believe on the network, the point of network is super valid. So I do believe that, you know, there is the, the easiest way for me to recruit someone is, is, is if, if by any chance, you know, you would have worked with the person, you know, with the person or doesn't have been in touch. I would encourage all the young folks just to reach out to the folks on LinkedIn. I mean, you know, they they all hanging out on Facebook, so what have you? Like, you know, do do feel free to build your network on, on LinkedIn, perhaps. I'm not trying to make a kind of advertising from LinkedIn because it's Microsoft product, but it's, it's <laughs> our, I, I don't know any other professional network. I'm just using LinkedIn, so uh, I'm just coming from. It's like you know, get reach out to the folks. Like people are usually perhaps more 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 approachable than what you may think. You know, and, and frankly, if you don't respond, so be it, right? But you, you tried it. Um, but building some of the networks, having some conversations is very valuable. Um, I do think um, that besides that, I would perhaps think about some basic things like leverage the network to understand the company, to understand the, you know, what this company actually about and what is the culture there. Uh, I myself have been sometimes I review 400 different CVs. That's literally what I did, 400, to narrow it down to probably 10, to come to the conclusion that none of these people are the right fit for the job. So there's lots of work that happens behind the scenes there, but it is still better not to go for a person that you're not really comfortable with than hiring the person, making perhaps that person quit another job where the person is happy to join the team and then to see that person failing. It is not just about the company, this is much about the individual applicant. And, and I would really encourage everyone get into the interviews prepared, know your strengths. And, and I would sometimes say it's even more important to know your weaknesses. And, and I can tell you nine out of 10 interviews when I ask, what's the biggest mistake you ever did? Nine out of 10 people aren't able to tell me that. And, and, and that's somehow concerning, right? Because I mean, I, I, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I do at least five mistakes daily, right? If you ask me now, which, when was the last mistake? I was like, okay, I'll give you time. I, I couldn't shut up like now probably, you know. But, but I will agree. Right, so it, it's just like know that, know yourself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Be transparent, be honest, because it's 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 what Rafa says, like a marriage, it's like a date. As important is it for the company? As important is it for you as individual um, to understand what are they looking for? Do I feel comfortable with it? This is how I am, guys. Do you see me fit in? And if not, hey, thanks for letting me know. Um, this is this is probably my my philosophy around recruiting. Yeah, uh, let me ask a couple of things uh, because I, the the network piece I just mentioned, and I feel very very passionate as well. I mean, I can tell you about by experience. About a year or two ago, I started to look for okay, what is the word I want to land after my career in PNG, and and I started to reach out to people, and you got a little bit of a fear of how am I going to send this message to someone that I just don't even know that person. I mean, I just see the name in in a, in a screen. And, and it's daunting. It's, a, it's very daunting to kind of like, how am I going to approach Jasko or, or Rafa, just for the sake of, of, of using us, and tell them me located in France or located in whichever country, and I just want to have a chat for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. 
and and I I did that, and I can tell you the biggest surprise was the overwhelming response that I got from people that I never knew in my life that they were more than happy to to talk to me. I remember one finance director who was willing to talk to me because he was driving from Zurich to I don't know where in Europe, and he was two hours in the car or four hours in the car. I said, "Hey, call me. I don't have anything else better to do." And he gave me like about one hour plus of his time to talk about multiple things, his industry and. And you learn, you learn because in that kind of environment, it's not an interview, but you learn a lot about what is the challenges that that industry has. So if you're applying for that industry, then you can say, wow, you can validate, wow, this is not for me. Or the industry is not at the level yet that I feel comfortable. It's too too wacky or too too early in the career, the, the too early on the startup. I, I, for example, don't particularly feel comfortable in very early startups, but I feel more comfortable in a little bit a, a more to develop a startups. So it really depends and that helps you to understand where you are. And there is not a right or wrong answer. It's just more information that you get. You get more bears on your knowledge. And when you are having properly interview, your questions are far more targeted to what you really want to know. Because you as a candidate, the candidates are, they're putting a lot of mistake. And, and either because they're taking the decision maybe to move to the geography or they're willing to give up jobs and maybe they're very happy. And also the company and the, and the manager is going to have the confidence to say, right, you know what, I mean, this might actually work versus recognizing that it's always going to be uncertain, right? I mean, I can tell you also 100%, whatever you sign off, whatever jobs you got, the job descriptions, the reality is always going to be changed. It's going to be different. I and mean, it's very difficult to match the reality of the day-to-day -day in a job versus the job description in a one-to-one. -one. There is always going to be gaps. And there's always that level of uncertainty, that level of gut feeling to hold hands and jump. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's excellent to hear this advice from both of you, because I think you know, it's the kind of thing that I tend to, to be telling people on a daily basis. But I think actually to hear it from people in your position will give them extra confidence to, to actually go out and do these things. I mean, I think the, the networking thing is, is huge. I mean, I think it, it, people have a a lot of people have a fear of rejection or uh, when they um, uh, try to reach out to people through through networking and, and then will revert to applying to jobs on LinkedIn. Uh, but as, as Jasko mentioned, you know, I mean, I think the average number of applications for jobs on LinkedIn is about 250 now, you know, and I think, uh, yeah, you do see it happens on, on such a regular basis that people are overlooked because the, the volume of applications. I mean, we had a situation this month, actually, where, you know, um, a lady applied to a job, a big client on, on LinkedIn and was one of over 400 applications. Uh, CV was overlooked. But because I knew the hiring manager, I presented it to the hiring manager and she ended up getting the job, you know, uh, and uh, they, they would just say, well, we're going to have to hold our, hand, hold our hands up here. The system let us down. But that's that is the that you know had had you know we not known the person then that wouldn't have happened and i think it's so the people have to have that um yeah to, to try their best to remove that fear of rejection and and it does help the job search massively uh, and uh, yeah it's uh, a big thing in in the current market so um yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah i think i think uh, uh, paul the one thing i will say is like uh, and i tell also my my kids is what's the worst thing that can happen so you send an email to someone to ask for 10 minutes chat. What is the worst thing that's gonna happen? How it's going to influence your life? And suddenly you realize that the worst thing that can happen is that that person doesn't have the time and doesn't answer you. Mm -hmm. That's that's all, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is also to kind of like uh, feel a little bit of the, uh, take the, the, the feedback, the, the, what is, and, and really think, what is the worst thing that can happen? Did mm -hmm. you make a mistake? Did you make the wrong thing? Did you, did you do a bad interview? But we already, everybody has done it. You just learn from it. There's nothing happening. You're not going to become a, a worse person or people are not going to like you and you're going to go through the streets with a stamp in your face because people don't have it. It doesn't happen. I mean, so it, let's move, remove the fear. Mm. It doesn't tell something about you, right? I mean, it's not telling anything about you eventually. I think that as long as you don't take it like that, it's all fine. And I think what we heard as well, Rafa, you've talked with the email recruitment team, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I like, uh, yeah we got to, we, I've got to get a bit of a sales pitch in here, you know. So it's uh, yeah. of course, of course. <laughs> That's cool. Now, I know you, you're short of time, so I'm just going to fire one last question at you. It's a bit of an unusual one, so I thought I'd end the podcast in a bit of a humorous note. But uh, obviously, we talked about finance a lot. But I was wondering, if you hadn't gone into finance, what would you be doing? Sales. That's for me. I've been done sales. I love sales. I love talking to people. I love chit-chatting. I love convincing people. 
that's what I would have done. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I, I probably probably sales or, or marketing, but I think it's also. Uh, I mean, I, I really like the social aspect. I mean, obviously, uh, Jasko and I, we, we we come we come down a long way, and and we talk a lot, the two of us, and it's probably probably it's around 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 that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it probably will have been probably more in myself marketing and not necessarily a great salesperson. Uh, uh, maybe talk too much, but uh, marketing probably will have been the, the place where I would probably have gone. Uh, so cool. Paul does finance, you do marketing and I do the sales. Sounds yeah. good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, we've, got, we've got the dream team there. That's, uh, that's we need to find a new finance guy. <laughs> yeah, we need to find a new finance. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I say it's, it's been awesome to speak to you both today. I know you're really full on uh, with the diaries at the moment. So to get an hour with both of you is, is brilliant. I think there's a lot of great information here for the network that I know they'll, they'll take a lot from this, this conversation. So a huge thanks to both of you. And uh, obviously we'll, we'll keep in touch and, and hopefully see you again soon Sounds absolutely, good. absolutely. You. thank you very much uh, thank you very much paul and and Chasco. enjoy enjoy the good time and, and have a good evening by the way yeah <laughs> true true six o'clock here hey eric thank you yes, thank you thank bye you bye. very much bye. thank you bye thank you for listening to today's podcast episode if you'd like to reach out to paul or myself please feel free to send a connection through on linkedin And if you'd like to listen to previous episodes of the podcast, you can find them all at our website, www.emearecruitment.eu.